All right. Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming today. We're happy to have you here. Uh, today, we're going to talk about securing Kubernetes workloads using production grade networking. And in turn, what that means, we're at an OpenStack Summit, so of course that means let's leverage some of the hardened networking solutions we have from Neutron and applying them to secure Kubernetes workloads. Uh, my name is Cynthia Thomas. I'm a systems engineer at Mitokura. Uh, we're a network virtualization overlay company. Hi, everyone. My name is Tim. Uh, I'm a software engineer at Google, and I work on Kubernetes. And uh, I'll be talking to some of the Kubernetes topics today. Hello, everyone. My name is Irena. I'm an uh, open source architect at Huawei, and uh, also Courier a core team member. All right, so today we're, we're in Barcelona. We're going to use the, the Catalonia Intelligence Agency as an example of the, the workload oper workflow operations uh, that they have to face when they're trying to secure and provide resources in a secure manner in a timely fashion. Uh, so the CI CIA IT operations they're especially concerned with delivering, deploying efficient technology is in an efficient way, um, using the latest technologies, providing their agents uh, with applications that let them do their day-to-day -day important and very confidential work. Uh, so two of the people that are members uh, of the engineering team there are Anthony, he's, he's in charge of DevOps, uh, and he wants to help enable the CIA with um, deving, uh, DevOps and, and their methodologies. And then we have Berta, and she is an eager developer, and she's keen on using the latest technologies to deploy um, her applications in an efficient manner as she develops and tests them. Uh, and so she likes some of the new stuff that's coming out, like, like Kubernetes. Um, so how was the world before Neutron? Um, what, what were the ways that we enabled networking uh, for application development? Well, first, that, that project might get defined. Uh, the developer needs to, to define that environment. And it was basically like human-defined networking. It was the dev, dev person was going to call up or send an email to the sysadmin and make some requests for resources, requesting, um, requesting servers. Uh, the sysadmin would install the OS, call the networking person. Networking person would do a VLAN, define a subnet. Um, and then, of course, request uh, firewall policy or whatever was upstream on the, the firewall physical box. Um, from then, you know, someone would do the plugging in. If that was wrong or the requirements were wrong, that whole process had to start over. So, of course, you know, this is what was happening prior to uh, Anthony and Berta implementing OpenStack and Neutron in their environment. Uh, so they were doing things the hard way. Um, so as an example, you know, Berta, she, back in June, she knew of this project that was coming up in Catalonia. So apparently all these uh, OpenStack Summit attendees were coming to Catalonia to attend a summit, uh, and, and the CIA was really interested in tracking their, their movements. So Berta needed to help develop this application in a timely manner. So she went ahead to find this project and the resources she needed. Uh, and from there, she had to start that process. And that could take weeks or months. Um, Anthony had to configure the VLAN that was required to connect these um, servers. Uh, when she was ready to, to do testing with ex external access, these firewall policies needed to be configured, and hopefully there are no typos. But it was in the order of you know, weeks and months just to get delivered, and of course, uh, at the risk of not delivering the, the application on time, and, and all these rogue OpenStack Summit attendees could go around untracked. And then, actually, uh, came an initiative for project Quantum and essentially moved to Neutron. So started as an uh, OpenStack incubation project. In a few years, it matured to a pure uh, networking as a service uh, delivering project, uh, having both tenant and admin uh, APIs, which are uh, quite technology agnostics, and adding support for various networking topologies, having pluggable framework that allows to plug different vendors, L2, L3, and different advanced services uh, that can be applied on various um, technologies and vendor solutions. Uh, there is also provides some extensibility that allows to add more specific APIs uh, where it's applicable and supports advanced networking like quality of service and load balancing, VPN and firewall. So sounds cool. So back to our friends, uh, Anthony and Berta. Uh, 
Uh, Anthony really wants to help his uh, company to be more agile and more efficient and help Bert and her colleagues to do their work fast and uh, in a proper way. So he installs uh, OpenStack with Neutron, chooses the base uh, the best backend solution that he can find. Um, and then actually what previously took Berta uh, weeks and sometimes months, she can uh, achieve in a few minutes because now she's able to manage her own topologies and uh, actually her colleagues in different uh, departments can focus on their own without trying to synchronize how do they create the topology, how do they allocation of resources, how they do the addressing. And Anthony is able to supervise on what is happening on this deployment and sometimes to uh, put restrictions or interfere. Uh, so it's uh, much, much better than it was before. But still, uh, Berta needs to understand what topology she is going to create and what resources uh, she, uh, she requires. So uh, along the way, part, I apologize for my voice today. Uh, along the way, this, uh, this started to dawn on people that VMs are expensive. They, they take a long time to spin up. They're not good for fast iteration. Uh, there's a fair amount of overhead uh, in running your VMs. They're not portable. There's, there's all these problems. If only we had a way that you could virtualize part of the OS, but not the whole OS, uh, so that you could run on a shared machine. We've probably all heard about this thing, Docker, now. Uh, it's sort of taken over the industry. <clears throat> Containers are an alternative to VMs. Uh, you, you, know, you bundle your application and the dependencies, your libraries, but you don't need to bundle the whole OS. You don't need to bundle the kernel. Uh, this is much, much faster than a VM. You can spin up containers in milliseconds uh, as opposed to seconds to minutes for VMs. Um, it's very developer focused. The, the, the whole workflow is about fast iteration and not worrying about things that aren't part of your application. So this, this very simple UX really captured people's imagination. Everybody wants to use it. So our good friends, uh, Anthony, he saw this and I said, I have to have this. I can, I can run it on my laptop, on the plane, and I can do all my development. And when I get off, when I land in Barcelona, I just fire up my application and it just works. And he start, so they, they want to try it out. But containers are, are very chaotic. Once you have all this freedom to do things, people do things. And you can't manage them. So they needed some help to manage uh, what's going on. So along came this thing called Kubernetes. Uh, if you've been here at all this week, you might have heard about it. Um, Kubernetes brings for an API for managing uh, containers at scale. And the API around Kubernetes is very application-centric. We want to focus on the things that you need to run your applications, and we don't want to focus on things like infrastructure and operations. Those are things that are solved outside of the Kubernetes system itself. We want to integrate with the existing infrastructure and ops flows. So looking back at our, our Neutron setup, we, we want to integrate with Neutron, but we don't want to re-expose Neutron. We don't want to wrap it. Networking is infrastructure and security is ops. These are two things that are explicitly out of the sphere with Kubernetes, but we still need to address those concerns. So Kubernetes has introduced this concept. Uh, oh, sorry, I'll, I'll uh, st speak to a minute for the Kubernetes network model. The, the Kubernetes network model <coughs> assumes a, a large flat network space. Everything is shared, everybody can see everybody, that's it. There's no noun for network, there's no concept of multi-tenant. Uh, you have plugins, which can let you decide exactly which network technology you're going to use, um, but all connectivity is enabled by default. It's implicitly single tenant. You can see this in things like DNS, where we may be two different departments running on the same Kubernetes cluster, but I can DNS look up your names and vice versa. You compare this to the default Docker networking model. The default Docker networking model actually does have a noun for networks now, finally. Uh, and it focuses on more app-centric networks, um, which is really an interesting blend of infrastructure and uh, applications. So Kubernetes, uh, sorry, so we have some, uh, some tension between our teams, right? Uh, Anthony is he's distressed. I can't have Carlos looking at my, my work. That, that's not good. But this is the CIA, after all, right? <clears throat> So within Kubernetes, there's this concept uh, of namespace. And a namespace lets you take a big cluster and carve it up into smaller uh, sub-clusters, if you will. Uh, and it you take all of the main Kubernetes concepts, like pods and services and namespaces uh, and uh, replication, and they are all namespaced. 
what a namespace gives you is the freedom to call things whatever you want to call them. If you want to call your database DB, that's fine. If Richard decides he's going to call his database DB, that's also fine because he's in his own namespace. Um, namespaces are used for different things by different people in Kubernetes. There's different ways to use it. There's no right answer to it. Um, but the important thing is that it does not have a relationship to nodes or to networks. Every namespace exists on every node, and they're all part of the same network. So it's, it's a horizontal stripe, not a vertical stripe. But it seems like an obvious place, if you're going to apply some sort of network policy, that you might want to tap into this. So we introduce a concept in Kubernetes called network policy. And network policy is just an API for the application developer to describe their application's connectivity uh, sort of in the form of a graph. It says who is allowed to talk to who. Um, and then you can use the network infrastructure to enforce that graph. Uh, this is applied per namespace. So you go into my namespace and I say, I'm going to default disable all networking except for the things that I allow. So now I can say my front ends can talk to my middle tier and my middle tier can talk to my back tier or my, my database, but never from the front straight to the database. And these other random people out there, they can't talk to me at all. This, uh, this does not yet cover egress. This is a, a beta construct in Kubernetes still. So you can see here uh, some Kubernetes YAML. I know everybody loves to read YAML on a slide. Um, but what you see here is our network policy object. And specifically, pay attention here. So the way we describe network policy is you start with the receiver. So the receiver, this is a selector in Kubernetes. It defines the group of, of uh, pods, compute entities, that you can apply policy to. So this says all of my middleware can be accessed from my front end. Okay? And you can see the same in the other side where I say all of my databases can be accessed by my middleware. So I've just implemented the graph that I drew here. And everything else is default denied. So while Kubernetes has a remarkable user experience, it still lags behind a neutron with regards to what networking functionality it can support. In Neutron, we have a fully multi-tenant environment allowing a overlapping IPs, while Kubernetes is essentially the single tenant right now. Uh, with regards to different network topologies that you can create, in Neutron, uh, there are a lot of different choices, uh, while Kubernetes is by, at least by this definition, is a flat shared networking uh, space with IP per pod. Uh, when we talk about security, in Neutron we have security groups, we have port level security enablement, we have ARP uh, spoofing. In uh, Kubernetes, there is currently network uh, policies for ingress traffic only, but more to come. Uh, in Neutron, there are also different advanced services and uh, also on the port level, such as quality of service that you can apply bandwidth, bandwidth limitation and DCP marking, which is uh, not covered uh, by Kubernetes, at least at this point, and Neutron having both uh, admin and tenant-facing APIs, while Kubernetes is a primary application-centric specific. Um, with regards to containers, there are also uh, different challenges that, uh, that exist right now, and there is no holistic solution that can address them all. For example, different uh, container orchestration engines has have different uh, abstractions, some uh, that they use. Uh, they adhere to different interfaces, like the CNI or the CNM. In uh, Mesos, there is isolation and network info. In Kubernetes, there is currently no uh, construct for network, but there are network policies. In Docker, there is no, uh, there is a notion for, for network, uh, but they're all different, and you, it's quite challenging to put everything together. Um, with regards to the multi-host environment, uh, there, there is a need to uh, interconnect host. And with Flannel, for example, you can do the tunneling, but there are some environments where a different solution can be more appropriate. Uh, with regards to security, uh, there is uh, some uh, potential risks at the Docker breach where uh, the containers um, uh, network stack is actually intervenes into the host network stack, and sometimes running containers inside VM uh, will provide a better solution for security. Uh, in some environments, uh, multi-tenancy will be required, uh, and it, 
It is not that easy to achieve in the current uh, containers orchestration engines. And sometimes, especially when there are some legacy applications are moving into microservices, uh, there is some transition period when uh, the application developers will uh, be glad to run both VMs and containers on the same uh, networks. Uh, so having all these challenges, actually courier projects uh, comes and tries to provide solution to address most of them. Uh, courier, and you probably heard a lot of it during the summit, uh, trying, trying to bridge the gap uh, between the containers world and the OpenStack world. And with regards to networking, it just tries to, to bring the Neutron as a networking solution for different container orchestration engines. Uh, by its essence, it just takes the COE, the container orchestration engine's constructs, data model, and translates it into the Neutron. Uh, and if we look, take a look about the translation uh, we decided to do for to bridge Kubernetes and Neutron via Courier, so the translations that we have, we're taking the namespace and it's actually translated to Neutron and Network and Subnet. And by this, it already provides some sort of isolation, isolated domain for the Kubernetes namespace. Uh, uh, Kubernetes pod is translated to the Neutron port, having its IP and MAC address. And actually, in this sense, uh, Neutron is managing the IP uh, allocation. When we take a look on the Kubernetes services, uh, and service is by its essence is actually stable IP for the group of equivalent pods. Um, it, it is translated to the Neutron load balancer, while service endpoints are uh, the load balancer pool members. If the service is supposed to be uh, accessible from the outer world, so then it gets its uh, external IP mapped to the floating IP on the Neutron uh, external network. And when we take a look on the Neutron uh, on the network policy that Kubernetes uh, uh, has, it's a uh, it's going to be translated to the set of security groups that are going to be applied on the port level to enable uh, all the use cases that Tim uh, previously mentioned. And uh, just a few words about the uh, courier implementation. It implements all the generic code that is required to bring uh, different um, Neutron solution uh, to the uh, COEs, and actually on each uh, Neutron uh, plugin imp implementer is just to provide some binding script that will bind the container or the pod in case of Kubernetes and the host uh, environment. So back to our friends, Anthony and Berta. Uh, Anthony is constantly looking how to improve the existing environment. And now he heard about Courier. He saw that it uh, started to mature. And he wants uh, to be uh, the first one to try it. So he adds Courier to his deployment. And now it's, it's actually much more easy for Berta by using only the Kubernetes API and by expressing your uh, application requirements through the deployment uh, and having network policies to uh, request what is about to, what is allowed to talk to, to what tier is about to talk to each, to what tier. She can orchestrate everything from the Kubernetes API and it's going to be translated by courier into the Neutron and security groups. And Anthony is able to tune everything from the a Neutron a API for, a, for administrator and make it work as, a, as good as Neutron can, can bring. So now I want to touch a bit about the uh, POC solution that we, we have working for, uh, for in integration of Courier, Kubernetes, uh, and uh, we we'll take the MidoNet as a plugin uh, Neutron implementation, for example. And this solution is currently working as a downstream implementation for Courier uh, Kubernetes integration. So if we take a look on the master node, in addition to all the uh, other Kubernetes components, we have the Courier Watcher uh, that actually checks uh, the stream of the uh, Kubernetes API events. And for each relevant entity that is uh, created, modified, or deleted, such as uh, namespace and pod and service, it gets uh, the proper translation and, call, and calls Neutron uh, API to create the corresponding data model in the Neutron. On the worker node, 
we have um, the CNI plugin for Kubelet, which is uh, the Kubernetes worker node agent. And it is using the courier CNI uh, to bind uh, the pod to, to this host. What happens while a courier watcher creates the proper uh, entities, it just adds annotation annotations in the Kubernetes data model, so when it comes to the CNI, it can get all the required information of the created port, such as IP and MAC address, and it, uh, it gets the proper binding. Courier Watcher also uh, checks the network policies and then translates them to the security groups uh, by, by which providing proper isolation uh, that was required by the Kubernetes application. So just a few words about the implementation details. It's event-based design. As I mentioned, it just uh, watches the Kubernetes API. It is compatible with Kubernetes 1.2. Uh, two main components, the courier watcher on the master node and the courier CNI on the worker node. And it uses uh, the generic uh, courier port binding where each um, a vendor uh, has to put very small uh, binding script in order for his solution to work. It uses the AsyncIO library, so it's a Python 3.4. And um, last but not least, there is no uh, need for queue proxy to implement the Kubernetes services because we have this uh, mapping to the neutron load balancer. Yeah, and just to chime in a little bit on that too. So Kubernetes being an, o an open source project, much like OpenStack, some of these functions can actually be interchangeable and, and are meant to be best, best of breed depending on the deployer. Um, so in this scenario, Cube Proxy, as we saw previously, it takes that function of load balancing, basically, as we know it on the Neutron side. So it can be replaced with a Neutron load balancer as a service. So in this example, um, removing the need for Cube Proxy on the worker nodes um, can in turn be achieved by the Neutron solution. Um, so Meternet, as an example, would be the, the Neutron solution. We know that scales a hardened solution from Neutron achieving the layer 2, 3, 4 networking services, and that can just be installed on the worker nodes. So that way, when, when the courier watcher is doing the translation from the Kubernetes API to the Neutron API, the, the Neutron plugin can just behave as it normally use, usually does. Um, so how is Meternet a scalable Neutron solution? Uh, so for those who aren't familiar, Meternet uh, was started by uh, Mitokura about six years ago. So it's a very hardened um, solution, production grade networking uh, already in use. Uh, Mitokura has, has been involved with OpenStack since the B release, so strong uh, Neutron solution. Um, the way it was architected is that there's no bottlenecks in the network. So um, no service appliances or, or bottlenecks uh, and therefore has the ability to scale. Um, so I'm just depicting a little bit about the architecture here. Uh, the, the underlying hardware requirements are quite minimal, just IP connectivity between rather compute hosts or in the case of Kubernetes worker nodes um, and achieving layer two through four networking services through a, a simulation that happens at the edge um, and basically providing these layer two through four network services and delivering the packet uh, with an overlay being rather VXLAN or GRE. Uh, you might notice also that there's no controller here. It's kind of sort of considered controllerless since the agents that are residing on the worker nodes have the intelligence they need to pass the, the packet along uh, depending on the logical topology. Um, it also has a scalable gateway to allow um, ingress and egress traffic uh, through its BGP scalable gateway. And, and these are all basically just x86 boxes. As you can see on the top, we're sort of depicting the, the API, the cloud platform uh, that would hit the, the Metonet API and, and therefore in turn, uh, Metonet takes care of the, the networking underlay or underlying infrastructure. Uh, so as an example, you know, with uh, Anthony and Berta, Anthony uh, in charge of the infrastructure of, uh, part of the, as part of the ops team, he's already selected Metonet as a scalable solution. He, he has the trust in Metonet with OpenStack already launching VMs. Um, so now he knows he can trust it at least to even bind the, the Kubernetes pods as well. So therefore, he, we, we, it also enables through Courier to have virtual machines and container pods on the same actual neutron network or logical network. 
Um, he also values operational tools uh, since he has to deal with the day-to-day -day for his infrastructure. So other things that uh, he, he leverages are MetoNet Manager. Uh, and MetoNet Manager is a little bit depicted here is the GUI interface that gives him visibility into every single traffic flow that's happening on these logical topologies, uh, whether it be neutron networks um, that are joining these VMs and, and containers with Kubernetes, any policy that might be applied, uh, and therefore, in turn, which security groups um, or the, these network policies that help maintain the isolation between containers. Um, so as another example, um, we mentioned Anthony wants to provide Berta with these uh, more uh, advanced networking and isolation between these container pods, uh, and therefore he wants to try Courier uh, with Metonet. Um, so today, Courier, he can take Courier with uh, Kubernetes, um, leverage Metonet, and actually try it out. So now this is available in Tech Preview. I should warn you, obviously, half of this is fictional, half of this is true. I'll, I'll let you decide <laughs> what you can. But you can go to docs.metonet.org, and uh, the Tech Preview for uh, Courier and Kubernetes with Metonet is available there. There's an installation guide, operational guide, just to give you uh, a view. So one of the more advanced um, solutions in providing th this type of functionality for Courier. Um, so today what Anthony can do so that Berta can start playing eventually with the, the native uh, Kubernetes API is automatically launch a script to deploy the Kubernetes master node. And that's going to come up with the, the constructs that uh, Arena talked about earlier. So the, the courier, watcher, um, and all the, the regular courier constructs that you require. Um, also, there's a script to deploy the, the uh, courier, or sorry, Kubernetes worker node as well. So we can leverage that. You can deploy multiple, whether it be on a cloud or a, uh, um, oh, sorry, a virtual machine. Um, so it gives you uh, the ability to bring up m multiple worker nodes with the required um, constructs for implementing courier and Neutron and Metonet. Um, so in turn, you know, the, the eventually. What we, we didn't mention, but is maybe obvious, obviously, well, obvious to us, I guess. Courier, Kubernetes, Metonet, all three of these are, are open source projects. They continue to evolve, uh, and this is the stage where we are at today. Um, so some of the more enhanced uh, security uh, policies that Metonet can provide above and beyond what regular Neutron can. Neutron security groups have a whitelist type approach. Allow this, and this rule um, gets involved, or a port level firewall. Uh, what Metonet gives you the ability to do is it implements uh, chains and rules for the security group's policies. Uh, and so that, in turn, um, means you can do actually more interesting things if you're directly hitting the, the Metonet API. So Anthony has the freedom to do more interesting things if he feels, uh, depending on the type of actions, to join chains, join rules, do rejects, drops, um, linking chains, service type chaining type um, things. So much more advanced um, options that he can do. So as we wrap up, uh, we look to the future. Um, within Kubernetes, there's, uh, there's a whole bunch of things that we know we need to do. Um, I've been working downstairs at the container uh, lounge, and almost every single person I've talked to today has asked me about multi-tenancy. So, I think it's unavoidable. Uh, it is going to happen in Kubernetes, but it is a, um, a very big problem. It's very deep. Uh, so we're going to be tackling this over the next bunch of releases. Probable possible evolutions include finally adding network as a noun, um, adding finer grain policies, possibly adding rejection policies, adding egress, uh, adding L7 policies, um, adding some forms of quas and shaping, uh, and bringing multi-tenant services like DNS uh, into Kubernetes. Uh, again, this will probably be over the next year uh, as we develop these things. With regards to the courier uh, Kubernetes integration status, so currently it's uh, it, it's possible to say it's it's quite the early stage. Both CNI driver and API watcher are under a development. We have this downstream POC implementation. But uh, the, the, the lessons that were learned from this POC implementation are currently pushed into the upstream of Courier with the proper process of submitting spec, um, blueprint, uh, uh, development reference, and the patches. So future work is just to complete the basic uh, uh, networking connectivity support and then add support for uh, network policies. 
provide solution high availability, especially with regards to API Watcher, so it, it's not going to be the single point of failure. Uh, one of uh, the directions is also to add more um, uh, better support for different platform as a service that they uh, consume courier and uh, use OpenStack uh, networking, like a courier OpenShift, for example, and also a bridge between the OpenStack VMs and uh, courier uh, Kubernetes, so run the containers inside vir virtual machines. Uh, just how you can get involved if you are interested for So to get involved in the courier, uh, there is a community site. You have all the links here. Uh, we have the Git repo, so uh, please join and your help with reviewer uh, will be really appreciated. We have weekly uh, meetings. It happens on Monday. So please check and if it's possible, join if you want to influence. On the Kubernetes side, we have our community site where we track all our processes and features. Uh, we also have our GitHub repo. Um, I advise you not to subscribe to the repo. Uh, you will get more email than you know what to do with. Uh, but uh, we also have Slack. We have thousands of people sitting on Slack every day, including dozens of Googlers who are sitting there uh, happy to answer questions and talk to people about how to use the system. Last but not least, of course, Mironet, also an open source project. Uh, Mironet.org being the open source website, welcome you to take a look there. Um, you can also try Mironet with our, our quick start guide. It builds an all-in-one Mitaka Mem Mitokura 5. Dot, sorry, Mironet 5.2 release. Um, lets you at least get access to the RESTful API, and, and actually it's pretty easy to expand beyond that too. Um, so we welcome you to join as well. We also have the Slack open source uh, Slack as well for you to join and have if you have any questions as you try and deploy. Um, so we welcome you there as well. So thanks for your time today. We welcome questions if you have any. And there's a mic on the left aisle. I have a question regarding to external IPs. Uh, for us in Kubernetes, external IPs pose the difficulty because they are FizzDev in, so they need to be bound locally on the on the server. So, how do you deal with that in a in such a dynamic environment? Uh, so, there's two answers. The one is the the way Google Cloud does it, uh, which we actually have a script that runs on every machine that watches uh, a metadata service that, that adds it as a local route. Um, but then Kubernetes actually works around that. Um, Kubernetes, the way we do receive uh, receipt of traffic, if you're using a service, um, we will set up IP tables rules to accept traffic to that IP address. So if the packet is delivered to the host, uh, and, and to the host interface before it gets a chance to be rejected for non-local address, uh, we will trap it through IP tables and do what we need to do with it. So if, if that's not working for you, I would love to hear more. I guess I can add from a meter net perspective, what we usually do for access to an external network is it's achieved through the BGP gateway. So the BGP will advertise whatever this external network would be, and whatever the upstream router is, it's learning that uh, floating IP address or external network from a Neutron perspective. Um, so that, that and therefore, is, is uh, reachable from, from our gateways. Um, I, I'd love to hear more about that use case as well, how you're, you have to have it pinned there. So maybe we can talk a little bit after. Okay, thanks everyone. Hope everyone's been having a good summit.